All right. How are y'all doing? Have y'all eaten too much candy in the last 24 hours? Yeah? No? Like Pastor Drew said, we're going to be in Galatians tonight. If you don't have a Bible, there's one over there. You'll need it. Um, but first, I want us to take a look and we're going to open our Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 13. So, so turn to Acts chapter 13 and we're going to begin reading verse 13. One of the things that I want to do is, this is a fantastic book. Um, and one of the things that I like to try to do to help me kind of put these things together and help you to start, I, I don't know about you guys now, but when I was your age, when the, when the Bible was presented to me, it was presented as single individual stories, and they never really tried to make the connection to the greater whole. So they were fascinating stories and interesting stories, and I, I was aware of them. But what was the point of the stories that were being told? And I'm here to tell you there is. That's the, that's the purpose of this entire series that we have been going through with you guys, the Emmaus Road. It is Jesus with the disciples pointing to all of Scripture and how they testify to Him. We are now in the New Testament, and now we are looking back and seeing how those promises in Christ have been fulfilled and what we are to do when we go forward. So kind of the analogy I think would help is um, if you've ever put a jigsaw puzzle together, you throw all the pieces out on the table and you scatter them out. Can you put them together, just flip them over and just start putting them together just at random and can you ultimately put the puzzle together? The answer is yes. But there's also a way to help you do that. What do you do? You separate the edge pieces. Put the edge pieces together. Start working your way in and out looking at the picture. There's a way to do it and then there's also a way to do it with a rhyme and a reason. The Bible is put together for us. There's a purpose to all of it. What we're going to see in this book tonight is he's going to reach back. We've talked about it way back and um, gosh, last year when we first started this. All the way back to Genesis, God makes a promise to a man. And He calls him out of his homeland. What is that man's name? Who? Abraham. And in Genesis 12, He calls him out and He tells Abraham, I will make you a great nation. And those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. And I will make you into a great nation. Well, that's not that big of a deal, but what was special about Abraham at this point? Was he married? Was, he was. Was he young or was he old? Had he had any children with his wife at this point? No, he's 75 and he has no children. And then you fast forward into uh, Acts 15 and God ratifies this covenant with Abraham. And we're going to hearken back, the Apostle Paul is going to hearken back to these promises that was made with Abraham way back in Genesis. Okay, But what I want to point out to you, the reason we're looking at Acts right now, uh, we have covered Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The epistles are letters written to the 1st century church. Many of them are written to specific churches in specific cities. Galatians is written to, a, to the churches in an area or a region known as Galatia. It includes uh, cities that we are going to read about, that you read about in Acts. We've just finished Acts from Pastor Tim over the last few years. We went through this. Antioch, Derby, Pergam, all of these that we will read, those are cities in this region. And this is where Paul takes his first missionary journey and he goes to this region. So in Acts 13, and I want you to see the connection here. We get uh, the, uh, the Apostle Peter at Pentecost, back in Acts 2, preaches the first sermon of the church at Pentecost in Jerusalem. 
And many of the sermons, what we would call sermons that have been written down, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and written down and preserved for us, have a similar look to them. But there is a similar look and message of what Peter says in Acts 2 and what Paul says here in Antioch in Pisidia. So let's begin reading in verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. Again, this is the region of Galatia. John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any words of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, you, know, you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm he led them out of, out of it. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them the judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me, one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize Him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning Him. And though they found in Him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have Him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of Him, they took Him down from, from the tree and laid Him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that, that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. Also, it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid in with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. This sermon, not word for word, but it's very similar to what Peter says at Pentecost. Why do I believe this is significant? The church is born, the New Testament, the New Covenant church is born in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Peter is going to be the apostle and he is going to take the message of the gospel to the circumcised, the Jews. That is his primary uh, mission field. Paul on the other hand, his call in Acts 9, his call is to take the message of the gospel and what Christ has accomplished to the Gentiles. And when you read the word Gentiles in the Bible, it's the same word translated nations. Read in nations. Gentiles. All Gentile means is not Jewish. Not Israel. 
Every other people is Gentile, the other nations. That's the message. Uh, that's Paul's mission. And he has embarked on his first missionary journey. And this is the area he travels through. So, we're going to fast forward to Galatians. And in the time um, of what he's writing us and writing instruction in, in the letter to the church of Galatia, problems have creeped in. They've crept in and he is writing in a letter really admonishing them. There's a definite tone with the letter of Paul to this church. Many of the epistles, uh, we have covered Romans, that's very doctrinal. It's not really addressing a specific problem. Corinthians, on the other hand, well, they had a lot of issues and Paul's addressing the issues. So now we get here to Galatians. A same thing. This letter prompted by the Holy Spirit for Paul to write is addressing a problem that has arisen in the church. Paul has planted him in Barnabas, and the church is growing in the first century in this region. So, this letter is written to them. And you can tell in the language that it is, though he opens with his normal greeting, there's definitely a different tone to this one than others. So in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Galatians, Paul introduces himself. He's Paul an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul, early on, will introduce himself as an apostle. Why is that significant? Why would he have to identify himself? I've just said, he, has, he's, he was instrumental in planning this church that's in this region. They know who he is. He's defending his apostleship because, first of all, the apostles were the disciples minus Judas, and then they replace Judas by casting lots and, and, and have Matthias. But then Jesus specifically himself thunders out of heaven as Paul is persecuting the church back in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus to persecute the church. And he calls Paul to this mission that he is on. Paul is now an, uh, an apostle and the man that was once breathing threats against the church and was a wicked and evil man is now an ambassador for the very thing he sought to de destroy. How does something like that happen? Only God's Holy Spirit can. Uh, uh, only God can accomplish that through the Holy Spirit. So Paul is saved. He's called on to this missionary journey, and this is where he is. This is this is the first area he attends. So they know who he is, but he has to defend it because he wasn't one of the twelve that were with Jesus while he was on earth and went through uh, the regions of Judea and while Jesus ministered on the earth, he wasn't one of those guys. So he defends his apostleship pretty much throughout his ministry. Beginning in verse 6, this is where you see the language um, change. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to, another, to, to a different gospel. Not that there is another, but there are some who trouble you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is a preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. The thing that has crept in, that he's addressing, is someone after Paul has moved on, and in fact, and we'll talk a little bit about it, he has returned back to, to, to Jerusalem. That is kind of the typical, he would go out for a missionary journey, return to Jerusalem, he would go out, he would return. 
And that was his pattern for his missionary journey. So he has already gone back to Jerusalem. I don't, and I don't think we really know when this letter was written, but it's definitely uh, written about this church on his first missionary journey where he's addressing these things. And they take the gospel of Christ to this nation and the Lord is, saves some and the church begins in this area. And then someone comes in behind them. And the, the, the common enemy of Paul and the gospel was not the unbelieving world of the first century at this, at this juncture. It will become later, but at this point, the biggest opponent of the gospel is Israel, the Jews. They're the big opponents. Those are the ones that crept in, and they're the ones that are upsetting the Galatian church. They're the ones bringing to them a different gospel. And as Paul says, there's not another one. And, and by the way, what does gospel mean? What is, what is that kind of... What, what, what is being said when we say gospel? What does that mean? Not what is the gospel, but what, when, when we say the gospel truth, what is, what is gospel? The good news. That's absolutely right. So, the good news. There's, not a, there's, not a, there's, there's no other good news. There's only one gospel, and that is the gospel of Christ. And he uses very harsh language that we lose in the translation here. And I'm not going to say this for effect, but I want you to, to understand. This word he repeats twice. If they bring to you a gospel contrary to what we brought to you, even if an angel from heaven brings you this gospel, let him be accursed. It's anathema. It means may God damn them. That's what it means. It's very strong language. And that is what he's telling them. It's not the curse word we use that our society uses. It means that that's what happens to those that are not in Christ. They are cast into eternal damnation. And that's what he's saying. That's how, that's how important the gospel is. And it also should give us pause. It gives me pause. You better get it right. You better get it right. We shouldn't be um, flippant with God's Word and, and what He has uh, revealed to us. And this is highlighted here. So as we continue to move, Paul continues to defend his apostleship uh, in verses 11 to 2. Uh, he highlights the fact that, and this is why I think that I believe that this is written after the Jerusalem Council. Acts 15 is the Jerusalem Council and the, and the church kind of convenes. you got James and you got Peter, the, the disciples, and, and all of them kind of, they've gone out uh, from Pentecost, the gospel is spread, persecution begins in Jerusalem, and they scatter through the, first, uh, through the regions there in, the, in uh, the Roman Empire. And then they return. And they kind of have a, a powwow, so to speak. It's the first church council in Jerusalem, and, and the, what they're trying to uh, uh, decide is, one, are Gentiles included in this? Is this promise for the, uh, for the nations, or is this still just the promise to the Jews? And is there anything that they need to do if they are included? So that is cleared up. Paul's confirmed in his... Um, in their message, there was not any confusion, but they, they, they get it together. And Paul talks about, again, he defends his apostleship, talks about his life prior to conversion. And then he addresses here, he says that he confronted Peter to his face um, in Jerusalem. He said he went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. And then he's going to have to address Peter because Peter, um, here's, look at it like this, they're kind of gathered around and they got a church potluck going on, okay? And this was a common thing and they're out and they're sitting around and Peter is rubbing shoulders with the Gentile converts and he's praising the Lord and he is just, he's very pleased to rub elbows with that which he would have thought was unclean and would have never associated with the Gentiles. They were dogs and unclean. They didn't associate with them prior to this. 
But now, because of the gospel, he's associating with them. But then it says certain men from James come in. And what that means is James is the elder of the church in Jerusalem. So some Jews come in to the fellowship and, Paul, and Peter distances himself. And he, he removes himself from the fellowship of the Gentile believers. And he wanders back over with the Jews and, and, and fellowships with them. So, you know, if we have a church fellowship and, and we all know each other and, and, and new people come in and we welcome them. And then somebody else of greater standing comes in and, and, and we want to, oh, oh I don't want to, I, I don't want to be seen associating with these people, so I'm going to remove myself. That's sinful. So Paul addresses him and he calls Peter out in public for his sin. So he's defending his apostleship. He's going through who he was prior to conversion. Says he opposes Peter. And then he's going to get into, this is where we're going to kind of slow down a little bit and read a little more. Because this is kind of the, 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 the crux of what he's saying here. And in chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, Paul says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we, have, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Tim talked about a passage last week that you should remember. Verse 20-21, through 21, this is a passage you should make a mental note of. Read it often. This is one that you could put in the memory banks. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If you are a believer, that's what we are symbolizing when we're baptized. We make a profession of faith. God has saved me through the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to identify myself with Him. So we are dead, buried, and raised to newness of life. That's what baptism is. That's the picture. This is the controversy that has crept in. The Jews... The Old Covenant... Any, anybody know what the Old Covenant sign of the covenant was? Anyone? What was the Old Covenant sign? Circumcision. Circumcision. The New Covenant sign is baptism. So... The Jews have come in. Okay, yes, Jesus Christ, all of this stuff, that's fine. But they must be baptized. Uh, they must be circumcised. They must become an Israelite. They must become a Jew. That's the message that the Judaizers came in behind Paul, Barnabas, and the others and start upsetting these people, start teaching a different gospel. There's nothing we can add to. Christ. And this is what Paul's saying here. This is where we're, he's going to start expounding some Old Testament truths and show and point out that this has been the case from the beginning. It is not by works of the law that anyone is saved. So in verse, or in chapter 3, here's that language again. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does He who supplies the Spirit to you 
and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him, counted to him as righteousness. Remember we pointed back, started out here, that, that, that promise to Abraham back in Genesis 12. He calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans and he promises him to make him a great nation. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you that very land that I just called you out of. He's going to send him back to it. His descendants will go back to this land. But the Bible says clearly, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's the promise. So, he's going to continue to expound this. He says, the righteous shall live by faith. This is an Old Testament idea. It's not New Testament. It's always been by faith. And we see it in the patriarchs. So after, in Genesis 15, after God ratifies the covenant with Abraham, and He promises, again, ratifies it. I will do this. And so much so, that the method that He uses to ratify the covenant with Abraham, God swears by Himself. Hebrews actually points out the fact that what happened in Genesis 15 was God swearing by Himself. He made an oath with Himself because there's nothing greater that He can swear by. So it's a done deal. It's, Abraham can't mess this up. Proof positive is Genesis 16. because He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I will do and to, to you, in you, Abraham, I will do it. I will do it. So what does Abraham do in Genesis 16? Anybody? His wife Sarah does, talks him into I'm barren, I'm old, we're both old. Here, have my servant. See if you can have a child through her. And he does. His name is Ishmael. That's not the son of promise. God makes him wait another almost 25 years. And he has a child with his wife Sarah. And his name is Isaac. Isaac has two sons. Twins, same womb, same mother, same womb. Esau and Jacob. The Bible says Esau I loved, Jacob, or uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Why? God's cho it's God's choosing. He chooses whom he puts his grace upon. It is by faith. It is given as a gift. We're working through it right now with Pastor Tim and the solas of the Reformation. We have gone through sola gratia, sola fide. Okay, that's by grace through faith. This is all of God's work. There is no boasting in man. If you are in Christ, there is no room for you to say, I was a pretty good guy. No, no wonder He's chosen me. I can stand here and tell you at 52 years old, there's no reason in this world He should have chose me at all. I have friends that live in this area right now. If they knew what I was doing right now, would not believe you. Would not believe you. There's no way. Because they knew the old Brad. It's like, no, there's no way. And they will be right. But it's not up to me. It hasn't been up to me. It's not up to you. If you were in Christ, it was not up to you. He chose you. So he's going to continue on and talk about the law and the promise. And he expounds on this. He hearkens back here uh, in 3, beginning in 15. He's going to give a human example. And we're going to go over what we just talked about. Paul says, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offspring, referring to many. But, to referring, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law. Uh, this, this is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Again, talking about the promised seed of Abraham we all know is Christ. But that seed comes through, not Ishmael, it comes through Isaac. Not Esau, it comes through Jacob. Okay? It's not Saul, it comes through 
David. There's a, there's a line. That's why the, the Gospels, we're entering into the, the Advent season, the Christmas season, and we'll start to look at these stories once again. And the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, they're there to point out to the fact that Christ comes from this line. That this promise, God has fulfilled. And He's fulfilled it in Jesus. So he talks about this. What is this 430 years? He talked about being exiles back in Genesis 15. He tells Abram, you, you'll be exiles. They'll be sojourners in a land not their own. Well, that's Egypt. So, he ratifies the covenant with Abram. And he says, and, it, and the law come 430 years after the covenant. Why so long? Why so late? So we can't point to, we still have a tendency, we're thousands of years from this promise. We still want to try to justify ourselves. We still want to try to perform. We still want to sign, okay God, I thank you for what you've done. Alright, now give me a set of rules to follow so I might can justify myself. We're not satisfied with the glorious truth that we have been redeemed and we have an alien righteousness. We don't have a righteousness that we can achieve on our own. If we knew how sinful we were, we wouldn't even try. We wouldn't even try. So 430 years afterwards, it's so far from the promise that you can't even tie this promise to the law. But He gives the law for a purpose and He's going to ask. The next, the next verse, He says, Why then the law? It was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary, an intermediary implies more than one. But God is one. The law is not bad. And that's where we have an issue. We want to try to perform to gain our standing before God. That can't be done. The Bible is abundantly clear. Pastor Tim talks often about when the Bible is clear about something, we're not entitled to another opinion. The Bible is absolutely 100% clear that righteousness cannot come through anything that we achieve. There's not a law, there's not a thing that we can do that will achieve right standing before God. Amen? We can't. It's not happening. The Bible is 100% clear about that. There's no ambiguity. 100%. So why the law? Because of transgression. Because of sin. We need a guardrail. We need to know what God's standard is. So He gives the law at Sinai. Does that help them? Well, the continued history of Israel says no. <laughs> they take the law and they still just dis disregard it. Completely disregard it. Or by the time Jesus comes around, it has been so perverted They've created an idol out of the very law that they have created out of what God had given them. So the law, it's a good thing. God's law demonstrates His character. It's a good thing for us to know it. It's a good thing for us to obey it. It's the very thing that Jesus tells the disciples before He sends back to heaven. He says, teach them all that I've commanded you. What did He command them? He's commanded them God's Word. God's law. That's what He's commanded. We have to teach people that. But we don't teach them and say that you can gain anything from it. You cannot gain anything from it. The law is there because you are sinful. Christ accomplished the works of the law so that we get His righteousness and He took upon our sin on the cross. That's what has happened. So He continues on uh, into chapter 4 and He talks about sonship and heirs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he goes back to uh, jump with me to uh, chapter 4, verse 21. And we're going to look, again, we've already talked about it a little bit, but Paul's going to use the same example of Sarah and Hagar. Remember, who is Sarah and Hagar? We just talked about it. Sarah is, uh -huh, and Hagar is her servant. It says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. 
Symbolically, that's what that word means. This, these women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. That's the law. Sinai is given at the law. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount, or in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. But the, Jeru- the Jerusalem above is free. And she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. This is quoted from Isaiah 54.1, that passage uh, we just read. That is follows the great servant song of Isaiah 52.53. And he talks about this. The barren one, the desolate one, Sarah and Isaac, those, they will be more than the one with a husband that corresponds to the Jerusalem below and the Jerusalem above is represented by Sarah. So, not only is God creating a people for Himself, like He promised Abraham, it's spreading not just, at this point, now we're, we're, the inclusion of the nations is coming in. And Paul, as an apostle, is taking this message to them. And it's going to continue to grow. Some of you might have seen the video I showed in here before. The church is growing. It has been growing for 2,000 years. God is working in this world. It looks bad. Admittedly, it looks bad. But we trust that He is doing a work that He's already talked about that we wouldn't believe if He told us. And by the way, He has told us and we still struggle to believe that He's fulfilling His promises through Christ. So, He closes by talking about our freedom in Christ. And, and, and he, 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 um, His frustrations with the Judaizers, those that had come in and upset the church of Galatia, and, and He kind of closes and, and, and softens His tone a little bit, and He even says... Um, <clears throat> that he would like to meet with him, meet with him face to face soon, so he can change his tone. He recognizes there's frustrations with him in this letter. So he speaks of that Christ has set us free. We can't understand what true freedom is in this world. Pastor Drew and Pastor Tim and I talked a little bit about this today at lunch. One of the things that Israel failed to do from Sinai was to be a light to the nations. And one of the things the church is very weak in, especially in the Western church, is um, there are blessings that God promised Israel for obedience. And there's curses for disobedience. And as the church, we experience blessing and we experience difficulty. We should go through both, like the Apostle Paul will say in Philippians, for I have learned to be content in whatever state I'm in, whether in want or in plenty. We should carry ourselves differently. We should prosper differently than the world, and we should go through difficulty different than the world. To make the world look at us and ask the question, what's different about you? The Apostle Paul, he says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Do we believe that? That's freedom. There's nothing these, this world can do to us that has really any effect on us eternally. Can we live that way? That's what true freedom is. True freedom is not trying to perform for our Heavenly Father. That has been accomplished. Just be obedient. Do what He says. Love Him. Praise Him. Worship Him. He alone is worthy. That's how He's going to leave the Galatian church as He closes the letter and talks about how to work through to follow the, the, the following the flesh is death, and, but to be led by the Spirit is life. And He closes the letter uh, with words of encouragement and how to bear one another's burdens because they are being burdened by the outside Judaizers and upsetting 
uh, what was begun by Paul. We know ultimately, and Paul also knows ultimately, the, the effects of the uh, bringing in the false gospel, it has no effect eternally on those that have been redeemed. Does it cause problems? Sure, it certainly causes problems. We have the same problems today. Nothing has changed. So what, I wanted to leave you with a little bit of, try to, to, to give some application from this. Uh, we've talked about it a, a little bit already, is, okay, so how do we address God's law? What, is, what does it mean for us? Why do we have it? Well, it's, God has given us a way to order our lives in society. So we would be wise to listen to it. Because the alternative is the wisdom of man, which is not wisdom at all. Like the gospel from the Judaizers is not another gospel. Is, there is no other gospel. The only wisdom comes from God. So, He's given us a standard. We would do well to listen to it. And based on what Paul's talking about here, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not been, it's never been about being an ethnic child of Abraham. It's never been about that. So, what's relevant in our day, and I don't know how much you guys pay attention to the news, but in case you didn't know, uh, about a month ago, it's probably been three, three or four weeks ago, the terrorist group Hamas attacked the nation state of Israel. Is there anything we should read into this? I'm going to say to you, no. The church needs to think differently. The true Israel of God, as he just said in this book, in this, in this, in, in this book to the Galatians, it's about the sons of promise. It's not the ethnic sons of Abraham that we are... They're just another nation that needs Christ. The same terrorist group that attacked Israel, if they are not in Christ, they are in Adam. And they need saving. That's, that's, that's how we look at that nation state of Israel. That's what I believe. I believe that's consistent with what Scripture teaches we get caught up on Israel getting a land back. And that's, it's, I don't believe there's significance there. So how do we as, as the church look at them? And I believe that we look at them just like we look at anybody, that, a neighbor that is unbelieving. They need the gospel of Christ. They need to, be, they need to have the gospel taken to them and we need to pray for them. Because there's only two types of people in the world today. And those that are in Christ and those that are still in their sin and they are in their father Adam. Those the only type of, those are the only two people that exist. The nationalities, the borders change. The Bible's clear. Borders change all the time. In my lifetime, the borders have changed in nations. When I was your age growing up, the, the, there was the thing called the Soviet Union. And it encompassed, there's a lot of uh, nations separated from them when the Soviet bloc fell. Borders change. Nationalities are not of a significance. So that's how we look at them. That's, there's two types of people. You are either in Christ, the second Adam, or you are in, still in the first Adam, which means you're in your sin. We don't need to overcomplicate things. So, that's who we take the Gospel to. That's who Paul's taking the Gospel to. That's why Peter stayed and preached to the circumcised. Because they still had pride in the fact that they were sons of Abraham. That means nothing. Ultimately and eternally, that means nothing. You must be sons of the promise, son of Abraham. And that is Christ. That's what I want to leave you with. That's how we approach the world. That's who we take the message to. That's who needs to hear it. Because we all were once children of Adam. We were born into sin. And we were enemies of God. But God saved us through Christ. We have nothing to boast in. The world needs to hear this message. And God is accomplishing great things, like He says, that even if He told us, we wouldn't believe Him. But we should. Because He's accomplishing great things and will accomplish great, th great things through the Gospel of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I do thank You for Your wonderful truth. I thank You for the opportunity to Share it with these students. I pray, Father, that and trust that um, there's nothing I say that has any power 
but it is your word that has power and trust in the promises that you have made that it will accomplish its purpose. And we can be certain of that as we take this message to the world. Be with us as we go about our lives. Uh, embolden us and, and make us uh, zealous as the Apostle Paul to take this message of Christ to the world who desperately needs to hear it. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.